Hi, I'm Megan. I'm Colin, and this is Pet Sitter Sitter Confessional. Confessional. An open and honest discussion about life as a pet sitter. Brought to you by Timed Pet and Pet Perennials. Family, passion, and pets all align with Ashley Ann, owner of Diamonds in the Rough. Today, she joins us to talk about her journey into the grooming world, what it's like running a luxury grooming salon, how she plans to leave a legacy, and where she hopes the industry goes in the future. Let's get started. Of course, Colin. Thank you so much for having me and sharing your platform, first and foremost. Um, But okay, a little bit about me, the grooming extraordinaire. Um, Everybody calls me the bougie groomer because I am nothing like your average groomer. Um, I'm that groomer that I love to add pizzazz to my dogs. I I like to add uh, gems, nail polish, colors. Uh, just really have them walking like they belong on New York Fashion Week runway. So um, I've been grooming for about 15 years. I started when I was 15 years old, actually. So I just celebrated my 30th birthday. Um, Happy birthday. And, you know, I, thank you so much, Leo here. <laughs> so I um, I got into uh, the industry when I was in high school. And, you know, I always tell people, they say, how did you start? And I said, I started. I, my, well, my first job was at a sneaker store and, you know, I had um, a very unpleasant lady ask me to put her, her shoes on her feet. And it was just the way she said it. I was not, I was like, you know what? I said, I am not doing this. Oh. <laughs> and I went home and I told my mom, I said, this isn't for me. I would much rather work with animals. And, um, you know, I know I meant what I said, but I don't really, I didn't think that the job was like real. I didn't grow up with dog groomers or veterinarians in my family. So I really knew nothing about the pet industry. And um, luckily for me, my mother knew a store manager of a corporate grooming business. And um, he, you know, he gave me an interview. I passed with flying colors and I got in and I started as a cashier, which is the funniest thing. I wasn't planning to go into the grooming salon just yet. Uh, but, you know, I saw the girls grooming one day and I said, oh, I would love to do that. Like, you know, I would really love, I got so excited. I don't know. I feel like my spirit was like, ding, ding, ding. This is, this is for you. This is for you. And um, I got into it. And, you know, the minute I stepped foot in the industry, it was like, it became an obsession. It became a passion. It became a love. It wasn't, it wasn't just dog grooming. It was art. It was making an impact on the world, changing dogs, how they feel, giving them, you know, confidence. Like that is such an amazing thing to do to give an animal confidence. And, um, you know, 15 years, I, I started as a, you know, like I said, a salon and a grooming salon. Then I decided to open up my own business, which I'm sure you're going to ask me about. And then I became this world renowned, uh, celebrity groomer <laughs> as known as the grooming extraordinaire so it's been it's been a super fun journey and um yeah it's a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah well and i think at the core of that it's it's you're being connected with grooming which it sounds like is really a very creative and expression uh expressive outlet for you um how, were you always interested in creating things and and working with with your hands to make something come to life Yes, you know, um that that I that's a gift. You know, I've always been hands on. I just um I see something, I want to do it. And you know, I, I have this gift of being able to master things. And you know, the grooming world is a very creative industry, and that's what I said. It's art, it's so it's so beautiful, it's so deep. The roots are so deep in the grooming industry. A lot of people don't know about it. And you know, I've been able to use my platform to shed light to the grooming industry, you know, through my artistry, through my craft, um, you know, through my my difference from other groomers. And um yeah, it's a it's a great it's I just love it. You know, everybody, when they talk to me about grooming, they're like, you just get this glow. And it's just like, you know, to me, when I'm stressed, I want to jump to my art. I want to get hands on. It helps relieve me a little bit. So I'll get the biggest dog, a St. Bernard or a Great Pyrenees or something, (laughs) Kali, and I'll just start scissoring and I'll get to work. And it's just like, it's, it really is something beautiful. And I'm glad that a lot of people are now getting to see what the grooming industry has to offer and show the world. Yeah. Now, when you approach each dog, do you already envision the end result or is it a process of discovering what that dog is going to look like as you work? 
Oh my God. I just have to see the dog's personality. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's really based on that personality. Yeah. So for example, if I get like a really hyperactive Yorkie or something like that, I would probably, you know, say you will look really good with a pop of color because you just bounce around anyway. So let's, let's try some color in a cute little cut. And that's how I'll be able to come up with the styles. But it's really about, you know, like the personality, like when we go to our, our beauticians and we say like, do what you think looks good. They're going based off of what we look like, what we feel like, our personality. And the same uh, the same rule applies to me when it comes to dogs. So it's usually I have to meet them first. If I see a picture, yes, I can come up with an idea. But I feel like the personality is really what um, helps me evaluate what kind of look that I want to do on the pub. I know with a lot of creatives, they go through, they, they have a creative process of, of coming up with ideas. D- does that ever get um, ex- tiring or exhausting to you? Or do you get energized from constantly creating and developing new things? Oh, my God. No, I love it. You know, I live by the saying, if you love what you do, it's never work. Right. And I really I really lucked out to do what I love. So to me, it's always like it's challenging. I, I, I said I'm a Leo, so I'm a lioness. I like to go for the, you know, go for the jungle, go for the kill. That's the type of person I am. Yeah. So I'm always, always up for a challenge, but especially with something that I love. You know, um, a few months ago, I had a client come in and she said, I want I want my bulldog to look like a tiger. I have never made a dog look like a tiger a day in my life. And I said... <laughs> oh, this would be fun. This would, this would definitely be something <laughs> fun. And, you know, I threw on my thinking cap and I went online and I looked up some photos of artists. You know, I always revert back to actual artists, not just grooming, mm. but actual artists. And I would look at, you know, their detail and their hand movement and their strokes on how they achieve these things. And I said, okay, I'm gonna do it on the dog. And, you know, that's exactly what I did. And it, it actually ended up going viral because everybody was like, this dog really looks like a tiger. This is crazy. <laughs> and, you know, it was just to me, the possibilities are endless when it comes to my craft. So I love what I do. I'm always up to doing some. I'm always up for something new, trying new things. So, um, nope, it never gets boring. I love it. <laughs> well, and part of your story that I love of trying new things is that you went to a very particular school to learn more about being a groomer. Tell us about your experience traveling overseas to, to, to learn more about a different style of grooming. Oh man, it was the best experience I have ever had in my life. And, you know, I'll be very honest with a quick background about myself. I did not grow up with diversity. Um, I grew up in a very rough neighborhood, you know, um, my lifestyle was not easy at all. And, um, you know, we didn't really have the opportunity more or less to travel out of state because we were a pretty big family and my, you know, my parents couldn't afford that. But to travel out of the country was something that I can honestly say I never, ever, ever in my life imagined doing, especially going overseas to Asia to go to the most prestigious grooming school. So to um, it still to this day, even when I get asked this question, oh. sometimes I say to myself, I'm like, Ashley, did you really go? And, uh, you know, I say to myself, yes, you really went. You paid, <laughs> you know? And, um, it was, it was expensive, but it was, it was worth it. And, um, you know, their, their quality of grooming is completely different from the American standard. And, you know, one thing about me with my craft and my passion, I want to master it. And grooming doesn't just stop in the U.S. It's, I feel like the U.S. is kind of a little bit lower at the food chain when it comes to grooming because countries like uh, Asia and, and Russia and like these areas, their grooming skills are insane. It's, it's, I've never seen it before. And it's like I wanted to I wanted to get my hands on that. So I ended up um, coming across a friend from Russia who went to grooming school in China. And I said, um, you know, Sonia, help me out. <laughs> Tell me where you went. <laughs> and she told me where she went. And um, I wrote a beautiful love letter to Mavis Howe. This is my first instructor. And she's actually uh, the founder of the World uh, Master Grooming cert- Certification. And a lot of people don't even know that you have master certification in grooming. And, and you could travel all over the world to achieve it. 
And um, I wrote her a beautiful love letter. You know, I'm the type of person, I'll make you feel good about yourself. So I was like, let me use, let me use my skills, take advantage of it. And I wrote her a beautiful love letter and I just expressed my passion. And I guess, you know, one thing I can say about passion, it doesn't matter what the language is, what your culture is, um, what your religion is. You could just, you feel passion. Passion is like energy. It's a currency. You feel it. And um, they felt it with me. So she welcomed, welcomed me with open arms to China. And I mean, we were in grooming school from 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. the next morning. And that's how intense their courses are. My first day, I spent six hours on one dog. And of course, the dogs get break, but their dogs are so trained for this. It's like, this is what they're born into. And they, the, even the pet parents, keep up with the grooming at home. I said, I wish half my pet parents <laughs> would groom their dogs at home in between, <laughs> you know? And um, it was just, it was so much to learn aside from the grooming, but the culture. And, um, you know, their grooming school is about two years to get your certification. The first year is your written, your written half. And then your second year is, is hands-on where you work on an actual dog. The first year you work on just dog mannequins. And, um, you know, I just I really just learned so much and they opened my they opened my eyes to a whole new world of grooming. And it just really poured into it poured into me in a way that nothing has poured into me before. And after that, I said, let me go to South Korea. Next is Japan. So, you know, I'm just I'm looking on checking off these masters. (laughs) Well, so how do you take that intensive course? And make it your own whenever you get back home to your own salon. What's that process in and now converting it into your own design language? Oh, my gosh. So in other words, I'm like the Michael Jordan of dog grooming, right? When it comes to my craft and my perfection. I, you know, I literally eat, breathe and sleep grooming. I wake up, I groom. I'm up at 5 a.m. I'm up till 2 2 a.m. just working. And I really, I push myself to master it so I can help bring that same craft to the United States, you know, um, bring that same craft into other grooming salons. One thing I've noticed, which actually helped push me to go into grooming school to want to start becoming more of an educator is people would always come and say, you know, there's no groomers like you. There are no groomers like you. There are no groomers that like you, you know, there's nobody that loves it like you, you know? And it's because from what I've realized, I don't feel just from my personal experience, not to shade anybody, but I don't feel like a lot of people teach grooming with love. It's more of a um, a dollar sign in a sense or a quick check because the group, the pet industry is a billion dollar industry. You know, um, the pet industry does not get affected by, you know, um, decline in the economic world. You know, we are always good because people will cut off their bills for their animals. So I saw that people weren't really teaching the way they needed to teach. So I thought it was important for me to master it so I could start pouring it into, you know, my community and into others. And if I realize when people are being taught with love, they develop a a better sense of value for their self, for their dogs, you know, for their businesses. And I'm able to make the world that much of a better place just by being able to share my passion and teach. So that is um, what I felt was most important for me to bring from Asia back here. And I don't only want to stop in the U.S. I want to bring this all over the world. You know, there's dogs everywhere in the world. I've traveled to so many foreign countries. There's dogs everywhere. Okay. And the dogs that are in these countries are on the streets. And instead of having them on the streets, they, I feel that we could build um, a, a community where there's grooming salons with people that are actually learning from an academy trainer and not on a YouTube channel or on an online course because you can't learn how to groom a dog on a computer. <laughs> you know, I don't know who came up with that bright idea, but I mean, I wish you would try to take what you learned from the computer and put it on a real life chihuahua. It's not happening, you know? So <laughs> it's um just being able to bring bring that here yeah. is, again, what my purpose is on life is to be fruitful and to multiply. Mm. So if I can, if that's the best way I can answer that question, that, that'd be it. Wow. Have you heard of Time to Pet? Chris Ann from Raining Cats and Dogs has this to say. Becoming a Time to Pet client has been a game changer for us. We can give our pet services clients real-time, cloud-based information they never imagined they'd be interested in. And most importantly, to me personally, I can better manage my company and look forward to more. 
and not a small thing, Time to Pet is responsive to my request for new features and modifications to existing ones. If you are looking for new pet sitting software, give Time to Pet a try. Listeners of our show can save 50% off your first three months by visiting timetopet.com forward slash confessional. You sound and you are somebody who has really tapped into their passion and is turning it into actions to change the world around you. What advice would you give to somebody who's not sure how to turn their passion into into a manifestation, into actions in, around them? Oh, man. Oh, gosh. There's so many uh, pieces of advice I could give. I think the biggest piece of advice that I would give is to really believe in yourself because, you know, let's face it, right, Colin? We're in a world where there are going to be people that's going to say you can't do it. Mm. And that that's going to be family. That's going to be friends. It's just part of the territory. But you have to be so confident within self, right, to where you'll be able to make these decisions and be able to manifest. The only way you can manifest something is if you know you're going to get it. And the only way you know you're going to get it is if you're working for it. Like, that's the key to manifestation. It's not just wishing upon a star. It's actually putting the work in, putting the work in and knowing it's going to happen and trusting in the universe for it to just give you what you need. And I feel like when people listen to naysayers, and they're not that strong or they're not that grounded, they'll get diverted from their their purpose and their path. So I always say, I didn't tell any of my family that I went to China until the night before my flight, literally, <laughs> even my mother. Nobody knew until less than 12 hours <laughs> before my flight. And, you know, I didn't tell anybody because I knew they would say, oh, why are you traveling by yourself? You're a young woman. You don't know these people. And it ended up being the best experience of my life. It changed my entire world. So me just being a walking testimony, I just I just try to tell people, go for it. But make sure you're doing what you love. Because if you're not doing what you love, you're not going to really fight for it, right? Mm-hmm. You won't fight for a marriage if you're not happy. You know, you won't fight for your for your, for your family if, if you're not 100% in there. And you need to be 100% in and dedicated to whatever it is that you're asking for so you can do what is necessary to bring your purpose to life. Because you owe your dreams as well, right? If you were given that vision, you owe it to yourself to bring it to life. So um, I just say, stay away from the naysayers <laughs> and keep your mouth quiet. <laughs> <laughs> stay quiet. Move and stay quiet. <laughs> uh, where, did, where did you learn to fight like that, to fight for your passions and to keep moving forward? Um. My life experiences, you know, uh, I, I'm always going to say I'm a Leo, so I'm very stubborn. And I learned, I learned the hard way. And again, I, you know, I just had this conversation with a couple of my girlfriends. And I said to them, I do feel like if my household, like my parents were more focused instead of working on issues from childhood traumas that they were still going through, I think I would have had a better um guidance and light and direction with Mm. light, you know, but because they weren't focused on me, I kind of had to learn on my own. Not kind of, I did. And I was also, you know, the oldest. So I was more of a parent because my parents would be upset. I would have to take care of the kids. So nothing was easy for me. I had to learn everything the hard way. And, you know, it got, it got to two points, right? It got to a point where I really got tired of life kicking my behind. And then I also got to a point to where I knew I deserved more and I had to fight for it. So when I started putting two and two together and started focusing on myself and focusing on my dreams and focusing on my goals, I started realizing that I was doing the right thing. It's the law of attraction. You know, for every reaction, you have an equal and opposite reaction. Mm -hmm. So it's like you have to make sure what you're putting out, you're going to get back. So I really just, I made a promise to myself to just challenge myself and better myself. And that's, that's how that fight came in because everybody makes mistakes. We all have to grow. You know, nobody's perfect. That's what I say. We're all born like this, 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 this empty person. Right. And then we learn as we're growing. And a lot of the times we're not always learning just from um, somebody telling us what to do. Like there's no blueprint to life and how to do it. You just, you learn as you go, but you do have, pieces of advice you know and I like I'm very big with my faith so I usually go to my bible if I ever need guidance on what I need to do and I'm it usually leads me the right way so I just realized um if I want this abundance if I want to change the world if I want 
to be this icon. And if I want to leave generational wealth and a legacy, I have to do it the right way. So, you know, that just, it just created a different type of monster, <laughs> a different type of lioness in me. And um, I guess I don't stop. I don't. Well, I, and part of that was when you are going through this journey, you you stepped out on your own to open up your own salon. How did that work? And and did you have any fears as you stepped out to go out on your own? Oh man, I am um <laughs> I'm spontaneous, fun fact. So I I I'd have fears. I've learned that um fears are non existent, mm. but fears also it helps pushes you, right? It helps um encourage you to move differently. It helps you to think um, more effectively. It helps you to become more strategic. And uh, when I opened my business, I just had my daughter and I was, you know, I was a single mother at the time and um, I still am. But, you know, opening a business and having a baby, I think that that was the craziest cliff that I ever dived off. <laughs> you know. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I think I just, I think I just dived right in. I was like, you know, cannonball. And I just jumped and, um, it was rough. I'm not going to lie. It was rough. It was, it was scary, but I, I, I knew a few things. I knew I was damn good at grooming. Um, I knew I was, I was a hustler. I, I made it my whole life by myself. I, so I've always taken care of myself. So I knew I could. I'm like, I, I could get money. As long as I make these dogs look the way they look and I have this personality, I'm going to get paid accordingly. Mm. And that's what happened. But, you know, three years in, I started realizing I had a way bigger purpose than just being a salon owner. It ended up becoming, you know, uh, I became this celebrity on Instagram. I started having HBO and Hulu and and. ABC reaching out to me. I started having people writing me fan letters. I had people popping up to my salon to, you know, leave me flowers. So the whole thing just, it, it, it was a curveball for me because I wasn't expecting this, but now that my storm kind of passed or I've, I've adjusted to my storm a little bit more, it's the blessings are coming in, you know, the light, the fun part of this is coming in, but let me tell you something. The first three years, Colin, what I was on my knees, <laughs> but you know, I didn't want to show anybody that, but it was, it yeah. was hard. It was really hard, but it was a hard that was good for me. You know, it, it molded me into a woman that is really making an impact on the world. So, um, it was fun. It was like hangover part three. Oh. That's what, that's what it was like. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> so, so in those times in those first three years, which I think is a really pivotal moment for a lot of people in business, those first three, maybe five years of really trying to get your feet under you, understand what you're doing and get all your processes in place and just try and figure it out. I know you have these, these dreams, these aspirations, making an impact. In those moments of those hard times where you were down on your knees trying to figure out what on earth is going to happen next, what was it that made you take that next step and then the next and then the next? So the the fun answer to that with me is where I kind of come into like my faith. Um, mm. It got to a point in 2019, I, I hired a PR. This was my second PR. Uh, my first PR, I had a, um, it was, I, you know, it was people taking money and not doing what they were supposed to do in other words. And, um, you know, it really affected me because like I said, I'm a single mother. I'm a, I don't come from a rich family, you know? So all of my money I've honestly made, I, I got a 401k when I was 15 and, you know, all the way through up, I was able to work and do it. And then, you know, the last PR that I hired in 2019 took, you know, 15,000 from me. And she, you know, she quit out of nowhere five minutes before I was supposed to go live on air um, on ABC in Virginia. And she didn't even show up. Mm. And when I say that that moment broke me to my core, you know, I was strong, you know, I was able to go through things, but that moment, cause I really thought that she was going to be the one to get me where I needed to be. And it was so devastating and I had to suck it up. Right. Cause I was about to be on ABC. I couldn't cry, you know, and I think that that was my reawakening moment. And that's kind of when I got, you know, God's attention a lot. And um, he kind of put me into a, a 
place in LA after this happened. And I know it was him because it was just the people that I I was with was an exact example of what I saw myself. Mm. As. So, you know, when you kind of get to the point in your world where you, you've had so many failures, who else can you look back at? That's where I was. And it, it just came down to God. So I feel like my faith is what really started getting me together, building me back up, putting the pieces back together. I was able to start, you know, understanding that the flesh is going to disappoint. I was able to understand that everything happens for a reason. I was able to understand that I may go through something that I don't want to go through, but it's necessary for me to go through it. And that's what all of my experiences thus far has been. So when I really developed that spiritual uh, relationship and that confidence in God and, you know, the divine and the universe or whatever people prefer to believe in, that's when it was like, all right, you're good. You're good. You got this, you know? So mm-hmm. I guess that's when that fear just became non-existent. Yeah. When you believe that things have a purpose and a reason, and it's it's hard a lot of times and most of the time when you're in the middle of it to see that purpose or fully understand why it's going on. It's usually not till years later where you can look back and go, you know what, that is really critical to made me who I am today. And that because I went through that, I'm able to face these other things because I went through that. I'm able to now do more than I ever thought I'd be able to. Exactly. You know, and that's that's what I was saying. Everything has a purpose, right? Everything you go through, it's a reason why you're going through it. And and again, you, you have to be careful to not let your your trials and your losses. And I don't like to use the word losses. I I prefer to use lessons, but you know, some people like they're not lessons, they're losses. So (laughs) however you want to take it, but you can't let that defeat you, right? You can't let it um, back you into a corner because that's when, that's when you're losing You're that's, that's when it's a loss, when you're backing down and you're not fighting. Anybody can fall, but you could always get back up. But as long as you just always try to remember that, the purpose is bigger. This is just a storm. This is going to pass. Like you'll be fine. And I agree exactly what you say. Sometimes it takes years. I've been in business for six years now. And, you know, the last three years has been the most challenging years for me because it's been like, you know, okay, I have the talent, I have the gift, but why am I still going through all of these struggles? You know, I'm dedicated. I give a hundred percent. Why, why do people still complain about things? You know, it's like now I'm able to sit back, step back, reevaluate everything and understand that I don't need to take it personal. That, that's the key to life. Don't take it personal. Do what you need to do so you can get where you need to get. And when, you, when you're able to start moving like that, you really are more efficient in achieving your goals. Mm. Now, you run a luxury grooming salon, and I'm very curious to know what the word luxury means to you and how you make that part of your your salon. So luxury to me is Elizabeth Taylor, right? Mm. Diamonds, Mm. glamour, um, Marilyn Monroe. You know, I'm just, I really am, I I, I can't say it enough. I really am bougie. You know, I like my dogs to look as good as I look. You know, they... I can't, I can't have them looking worse than me and I can't have them looking better than me. We always have to be on common ground. <laughs> and, you know, I love, I love, I love elegance. You know, people love to say, oh, you love the finer things in life. And I do. I love it. And I want to give the finer things in life. So I give that to my salon. You know, people walk into my salon and they think that they're in some, you know, I don't know where some, some erotic place, you know, just with flowers and lavender smells and diamonds it's just it's so it's so beautiful and it's peaceful also you know it's a wellness environment my dogs are comfortable my pet parents so some of my pet parents don't want to leave I have to kick them out you know (laughs) but it's like like that that to me is luxury luxury is 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 showing love through what it is you're doing and what it is you're giving Mm. and um that's that's why my salon is diamonds in the rough. They come in rough, but they're all diamonds and I send them out shining as they should be. Mm. I love that definition of luxury. It's showing love to somebody and giving them this experience that they never thought they'd have possible. Do you find that that's or how, how do you get that messaging across to potential clients in your community? I talk a lot. <laughs> <laughs> 
I talk a lot. I'm very straightforward. You know, I don't have to run around the bush with you. I'll tell you what it is right then and there. So, <laughs> I always, I really, I, listen, Colin, people love me because I'm honest. I'm very straightforward. You know, I, this is one thing, my easiest way of doing it. When people come in and they say, it's just a dog. I don't even want the basic. And I, and I say, well, this isn't the basic salon. Okay. Mm. This is a luxury pet salon. You see the walls. I use nothing but high quality product. Rose, rose hip oil, keratin, um, oatmeal, you know, luxury products. They, they walk out with pearls. They have diamonds. I, I, do I look basic to you? I don't look basic. So we, we don't do basic in here. You know, oh. I love your pups the way I love myself. So when people walk in and they see my dog, my dog look like she belongs on the cover of Cosmopolitan or something like that or Vogue, yeah. you know, and I want to make your dog look like that as well. So I always, like I said, I tell them straightforward, don't come in here and ask anything basic because I'm not giving that to you. You could go down the street to another salon <laughs> if that's the case. But if you come into here, you're going to get luxury. You're going to get a beautiful experience. You're going to get an experience. You're going to tell the whole world about, you know, and that's, that's my goal. That's, that's who I am. I am luxury, you know, so that's what I pour into you what I am. Oh. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and part of, part of that is, you know, you know that you are luxury. And I think part of understanding who we are and what our business represents is what we represent and the things we don't represent. And I am luxury. I am not basic. And that really helps solidify the position and the messaging and keeps you consistent too, right? Whenever you are purchasing products or whenever you're hiring people or when you're going through this process, you know what you are and you know what you aren't. And that really helps steer you and keeps you going on the right path. Absolutely. Listen, Colin, you would hear me say 10 million times self-love. Self-love is the key to your success in this life. Because if you really love yourself, you want the best. If we break down the definition of love, love is love is healthy. Love does not hurt. You know what I'm saying? It, like, and, and people don't get that. And when you, when you love yourself, when you put compassion into yourself, when you, when you put thought, you know, when you don't subside what you think you deserve, for what other people feel you deserve, you really want more. And that that was the that was the funniest part about me as a groomer. You know, I was always the groomer, even at 15. I've always been a diva, always. You know, when I came into the salon, I would have my hair done, my nails are done, my eyes are done, my eyes are glittery and shiny. You know, I love my glitter. <laughs> and um, people are like, why are you coming in, in a salon looking like that? I'm like, what do you mean? Why, why are you coming to a salon looking like that? You know, like, <laughs> Why are you worried about me looking good? Why do you look like that? You know, people, you know, the how dare you say that? But yeah. honestly, it's it's it, it's an honest question. I look like this because I feel good looking like this. If you feel good looking how you look, that's your business. But if I if I want to come in this salon and look good, that you know what that does? I give my customers confidence. You know, all of my comments on mm. on Facebook or Instagram or social media, the first thing people say is, I know my dog is gonna look good because she looks good. Mm. And it's, I look good because I love myself. So it just pours into what I do. And as long as you're able to love yourself, you can pour into what I, it doesn't matter. You could be a janitor. I bet you, you will have the cleanest porcelain looking toilets. It does not matter what you do. As long as you love it and you love you, you're going to be successful. So, you know, I've always knew who I was and, you know, people, I always have pushback. You know, why do you charge so much for grooming? Because I use good quality products. Try to get the, like, I will say, look at the shampoo I use. Your dogs will never have skin infections. Their skin will never dry out. I use Omegas. You know, I use what need, I use what I need on your dog. And I make sure that they're healthy. Even cats, they look good. They feel good. They smell good. They act better. So it's just like, you know, I tell people, look at the difference. Look at somebody that doesn't want to spend money on a gallon of shampoo. Your dog's skin is going to probably be falling off due to reaction. Anything that we don't put on our bodies healthy we react to it the same with dogs. So, you know, I just, like I said, Colin, I talk a lot. Okay. <laughs> I talk a lot. And I just make sure you get the point with me. That's it. You know, if you don't get it, you can't say I didn't say it. I'm going to have to let you go about your business. But other than that, you know, people get it. And that's why my clients love me so much. And that's why. You know, I'm going in a direction that I'm going with my business so far. Yeah. Well, I think it's, it's, they see that, they see that consistency in who you are and that you are the business and the business is you. And they really see your personality and that you're not just promoting this stuff. You're actually living it and you, you want it to be part of not just your life, but their life as well. So whenever they see all these things, it does match up. And I think immediately it sets those expectations for the client and they immediately know 
what to expect. And as you said, both in how you communicate, both in how you're dressing and presenting yourself, and, and then how you have your salon set up, it's all giving the solidarity message that the clients are going to be able to pick up on so that they, they know what to expect. And you, you mentioned that you get feedback sometimes on, on or comments about products or, or prices or things like that. How do you handle and process either negative or positive feedback when you get it? I talk a lot. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I'm picking up a pattern okay. here. <laughs> okay. I feel like communication is key. You know, you can never say you don't know what I'm saying because I say it all the time, sure. you know? Yeah. And I tell people, I'm not free. I, I get it. Everybody does not want to spend $200 on a dog. Beer. I'm not, I'm not here to service you then if that's not what you, you know, it's just, mm. I have the people that want to pay me and then I have the people that aren't interested, but you have to understand they're grooming salons all over the world. There, there are 10 salons within a five mile radius of my salon. You know, I don't have anybody signing contracts to come to me. You can come to me if you want. You don't, you know, I don't, I don't force you here. Now I also don't put in any, you know, ads. I don't ask for people to come. I don't do anything like that. So for you, most of the time people are coming because they're attracted to me, right? They're attracted to what it is that I offer. Yeah. They're attracted to my dog. They're attracted to, you know, my salon. So it's just, if that's what you want, then that's what you pay for. So I, I'm always just very straightforward to people. I never get offended. You know, I really don't. I've learned not to get offended anymore. In the beginning, I'm not going to lie, because when you're so passionate about your craft, it's a little bit, it can be a little bit offensive, right? When somebody says, well, why do you charge this? And I just spent over 5000 to go to school in Asia, okay? So to me, it's like, what are you talking? <laughs> what are you talking about? I just invested a lot of money in this. So you know, but I also know that everybody, they don't know. A lot of people are unknowing. They don't understand the depth of it. And that's where it comes into me talking a lot. And I'll just, okay, this is why I charge this. This is for these products. You can go ahead and try here. This is what you will receive from there. Yeah. But this is what I can guarantee you here. So, you know, it, it's, I always tell people, I'm not up for negotiation. I was supposed to be a lawyer, you know. And um, <laughs> I decided to go to grooming school instead. I said, you know what, I'd rather be in grooming school. And it, it's much more happier. But I definitely have that lawyer spirit. So, you know, I'm, I'm always ready to talk and explain to you and communicate the black and white of how it works. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's absolutely critical. And it's a lesson that I think more of us need to start learning and implementing in our lives is that communication really does get through a lot of those situations and scenarios. You set those expectations early by communicating them. You work through those issues by communicating through it. And then you follow up by communicating. And it's not going to hurt you by putting yourself out there and letting it be known who you are. You're only going to attract the clients that you actually want to be working with and are going to help support mm -hmm. and cheer on your business too. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's the thing I always, and a lot of groomers get so frustrated, right? Because they hate grooming mad at dogs. And to me, I tell people, you know, I don't groom mad at dogs in my salon. When I started, I did. I realized they were a liability. Mm, don't want to struggle because I know I could just groom a dog, make it look pretty and be happy. But when you're bringing in your dog because you you are being neglected and you you aren't being a responsible pet parent, you're not bringing them in on your routine. Your, your dog can't comb itself. So I'm definitely not going to blame your dog. <laughs> so, you know, you come in and get upset because I say I have to shave your dog or you come in and get upset because your dog gets snicked because he's uncomfortable with me trying to rip Matt off of his skin. You know, it to me, it was, you know, I like to talk, but I don't like to feel like I'm repeating so much to the point it's a form of insanity. So when it comes to I feel like I'm crazy, I kind of just cut it off at that point. So I made the decision to stop taking a mad at dog. I said, you know, groomers, maintenance groomers aren't even supposed to be service and mad at dog. That's a more severe um condition of the coat because it's a higher risk of incident. That's why a dog should go to a veterinarian that has a groomer on staff. So, you know, when I stopped taking a matted dog, um, a lot of groomers, they were like, wow, you really inspired me to stop taking a matted dog. I'm like, cause it's a liability. You know, I tell people they come in, well, my dog is matted. You're just shaving it. Well, you didn't go to grooming school. You don't know what it is for a dog to be matted because if you were educated on the topic of matting, your dog wouldn't be in this condition now, would he? Mm. You know, so people look, I'm a lawyer, Colin, listen, <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lawyer and I'm a mother to a five-year-old, so I'm pretty stern and I get the point across. <laughs> but it's just, you know, I'm not here to to pour my energy into, into um, 
into the low vibrations, right? Mm-hmm. I, I always tell clients, I like high vibrational clients. I like happy people. And that's what I attract. I started cutting my clientele base down. I started telling the people, you know, that weren't suitable for me. I felt they, my sanity is very important, honestly, before yours is because I'm the one grooming your dog. So if I'm not saying your dog is in danger. So I think you want to make sure that I'm happy before I put a sense into your dog, you know, and um, that, that just can't, you know, I just think that that's common sense. I don't want to make anybody upset that's cooking my food or grooming my dog or my child. I want to make sure we're on the same page. And, um, you know, but that's just me. You have humans in this world that will argue with a waitress and then tell them to bring back their food. I'm not the type of person. Nope. They're, they're living that's life on the me. edge is what they are. <laughs> on the edge, you know, and I tell people, don't do it with me with your dog. So, you know, I made sure that I made it my mission to be happy with my craft because, mm. you know, when I was dealing with the stress and I was dealing with the liabilities, I wasn't happy and it was affecting my performance at work. So I had to sit down and again, challenge myself and say, hey, Ash, what is it that you can do to make you in a put you in a better place? You know, like, of course, you can't turn everybody away. Of course, you're not going to have everybody coming in when you want. And of course, you may lose clientele because a lot of them may not be a good fit. You know, when I purchased my business, I had an entire salon clientele and I had my clientele. So it was like night and day. You know, my clients were angels. And then the ones that I purchased were like, I'm like, hold on, wait a minute. Like, what did I sign away to? (laughs) You know, and it was like, I had to, I had to start cleaning up house because I wasn't happy and I was stressed Mm. and it was affecting my performance. So I always tell people, it doesn't matter what you do. You have to understand, especially being an entrepreneur, it's a risky, it's a risky job being an entrepreneur. You have to build your clientele. You have to build your relationships. And that's the most, that's, the most important thing to a successful business is having healthy relationships. Everybody doesn't need to know the CEO, but if people have a good relationship with the company, they're happy when they go there, they're happy with the service, your, your business will be successful. But when you have nothing but negative and low vibrational things that you're dealing with on a frequent basis, like it's, it's, it's just, uh, I, I just think it's a fire waiting to happen. So I like to I like to keep my peace. I'm I tell people I'm like I'm dealing with y'all children, okay? I don't want to deal with you too. <laughs> Come in here, be nice. I'm gonna make your dog look happy, and we're gonna go about our day. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I used a really a key word there, build. You have to build your clientele. And I think I, I tend to forget that it is an active thing that I as a business owner have to do. I don't just passively allow clients to come to me or people who need services mm-hmm. to come to me. I need to be out there building that, getting the ones that I want and working my business so that it's meeting their needs so that they continue to come back. And when we get more passive about it, I think that's when we look up a couple years down the road and go, what what is going on? Like, why is this such a such a mess right now? Because we did we didn't build it; we just let it happen to us. Yep, accountability, accountability, and I'm accountability plays a major role in self love too. Because again, mm-hmm. when you start being accountable for things, you start fixing it. You start fixing areas of opportunity you know what i'm saying and we're human you know nobody's perfect like i said there's no blueprint to life um you're not gonna get it right all the time i'm not somebody that gets it right i'm somebody that really like i went through the hardest lessons for me to finally get it right so you know when you learn to start challenging yourself and you learn to start you know bettering yourself and saying like okay i'm miserable because i'm not doing this you know Forget the forget the middleman, forget the, the consumers, forget that part or the clients. Ultimately, you are the reason for your happiness and your unhappiness. And, you know, sometimes to think about it, get in your whatever happiness you require. It may be a little more work than the next. You know, everybody tells me there is no way I would have been an entrepreneur. Ashley, I cannot do what you do because I can't send customers that complain to corporate. So I make sure I don't take customers that complain, right? <laughs> I'm, I know I've mastered my craft. I know I'm phenomenal in what I do. I know I give 110%. And I know for a fact, there is nothing that you can complain about when I do your dog. And I know that for a fact, I communicate. I ask you what you want. I have my receipts. I have my master's degrees. I've done more. So it's like, I know where I'm at. So if you're somebody that likes to come and complain, or, or be upset that I can't service you, you know, because I can't make you happy. You got to find that happiness within yourself. So, mm. um, yeah, it's a uh, life is 
it's it, it's simple, but yet it's not. You know, we have the it's the the rules. It's simple because we know what we need to do, yeah. but it's not simple because it's hard to do what we need to do. And I always tell people it's not easy. So just make sure whatever you're doing, you're doing it because you love it. You know, athletes they they those are the only people I know that can break a bone and jump back on <laughs> on the field. Because I'm telling you, when a dog bites me, I'm ready to quit. I'm like, I'm done. I'm finished. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> but I go back because I love it. You know, I love it. So I've only been bit three times in my entire career, and I plan to keep it like that. I don't want any more dog bites. But And it's always been a Yorkie, a Poodle, and a Chihuahua. Always them. <laughs> so it's just. You know, I'm mindful with them now, but I always, like I said, I love what I do. And if you love what you do, you'll be able to get a little bit further and, you know, you'll have more cushion to fall back on because if, if it, it may not make you happy, what you have to go climbing a mountain is not easy. It's who said climbing a mountain is easy, but everybody wants to be at the top of the mountain. Right. Mm. So you have to do what you need to do to get there, to enjoy that bliss, to have that excel. It, it's a process. And as long as you're willing to hold yourself account- accountable, love yourself, put in the work, do the effort, do your due diligence, be honest, do it with love. You get there. It's not going to happen overnight, but at least those things will help you stay dedicated to it. Pet Perennials makes it easy as one, two, three to send a heartfelt condolence gift directly to someone with a broken heart. They have this awesome direct client gift service that takes the effort off of us as the business owners and ensures a thoughtful, personalized simply gift reaches our client or employee. All gift packages include a handwritten card, colorful gift wrap, and shipping fees across the U.S. and Canada. They also offer an array of milestone gifts and greeting cards that can be sent to celebrate birthdays, extend get well wishes, and welcome new and rescued pets. Additionally, there are gift choices in case you need to send a sympathy gift in memory of a special human client or celebrate a pregnancy, engagement, or wedding of a pet lover. If you're interested, register for a free business account to unlock the all-inclusive discounted package prices. Since the service is used on an as-need basis, there are no monthly or annual obligations or minimum purchases. Learn more and register by going to petperennials.com slash pages slash GPS and enter the referral code PSC at registration to get a unique coupon code to save $2 off any package you send in your first 90 days. I think because of your dedication and staying true to you, who you are and on mission, You've attracted the attention of celebrities. So what has that been like grooming for, you know, re- these really famous people out there? Uh, so that that has been I think that's been my biggest light because grooming celebrity dogs have really shown me that I am a celebrity mm. because it's just like I fit in that world so perfectly. I stand out, actually. And it's like it's been so fun because uh, they don't treat me like, you know, a, a dog groomer. It really is love. I, I go to their houses, I hang out with them, we build relationships. And it's also, you know, they learn and they take from me as, you know, I learn and I take from them. So being a celebrity groomer has definitely opened so many doors for me. And it's it's also helped me achieve my self-love because I have one client with a private jet and I'm like, yep, this is going to be me soon. This is definitely going to be mine soon. And they'll laugh and they'll say, you know, I can see you getting it. I see it, Ashley. I'll go into the mansions. I say, yep. This is going to be mine. And then I said, I see it, Ash, you know? Oh. And it's um, like, they have definitely had, they've been very supportive. Most of my celebrity clients are the reason why I'm, I'm pushing with TV and all of this stuff, because they're the ones that say like, you can do it. You can definitely do it. You have the face for it. You have the personality for it. You have the inspiration for it. Like people want to listen to you and they want to talk to you. So um, it's just, it's been super fun. I've, I've had so many benefits. I've gone to concerts. I've been backstage. Um, I get in a lot of places for free. I love to eat, so they eat great. You know, <laughs> I just, you know, I'm living, I'm living a dream right now, and um, you know, it's fun. I haven't, I haven't had any nasty celebrities. I haven't had any experiences like that. So, you know, it's been, it's, it's really been a very healthy journey for me so far, uh, transitioning into the entertainment field. So, it's been fun. Yeah, I think that may be intimidating for a lot of people to to see somebody like that walk through the door to get that call to come take care of this famous person's pet. But to hear you telling it, it's really motivating to you to to see that and to go, you know what? No, this is this is my next level. This is where I'm shooting yeah. for and to start oh, yeah. to start operating in that. Absolutely. You know, um, 
that's why also they, you know, another thing, I, I like to listen to a lot of motivational speakers like Zig Ziglar, Jim Rowan. Like, I love listening to them. Um, but one thing that Zig Ziglar always says is that you have to cover new ground. You have to meet new people that can probably see something in you that the people you grew up with never saw in you. You know, oftentimes when we stay where we are, we're kind of enabled at that point because you're not covering new ground. When you cover new ground, you see new opportunities, you see, you see new possibilities. And uh, a lot of the saying I kind of go by is people would rather live in familiar hells than to explore unfamiliar heavens. Right. And Mm. people rather stay in the hell because they're used to it. That's what they know. And a lot of the times your heaven is going to be your biggest blessing. So it's scary because you've never seen it before. Like I, like I said, I, I've never had a celebrity friend. I did not grow up in diversity. You know, it was five kids in one bedroom. It wasn't, it was never easy for me. So for me to come to this, I guess maybe it gave me a different type of hope and it gave me a different type of inspiration. Maybe because of my experiences is why I look at it like that. Or maybe because I'm a Leo. I don't know. It could be one or the other. <laughs> but I feel like a little bit, a little bit of both. Like I know I deserve good things in life. That's why I decided to move, you know, when I turned um, 15 with my mother so I can, uh, my parents were divorced. So I was living with my father. But when I was 15, I decided to move with my mother to Montclair. And that's when, you know, I started having different friends of different ethnicities. And, you know, I realized that I was adaptable also. So. It's like, I'm just an adaptable person. I could be in China. I could be, I could be in, in Brazil. I could be, it, it doesn't matter. I'm just so adaptable. And that's, I think, a gift that I've learned that I, I, I have. And um, it's fun. I, I told you I'm spontaneous. I really am. I'm, my five-year-old has gotten that for me. So I'm trying, now I see everybody's nerves a little bit <laughs> when it comes to me. But, you know, I'm I'm ready to dive with her. So, and if I have to grab her back really quick, I'll grab her back. But uh, it's it's been really, really enjoyable being able to hang out with these, uh, with the celebrities and just seeing a whole new world. Well, you mentioned your 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 five year old there. You're you're a mom. You're a CEO. You've got these big aspirations, and I know one of the things that you're really passionate about is making sure that you you leave a legacy. Why is that important to you, and 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 what does that mean to you? Um, it's important because I love my baby so much. You know, like the type of love I have. I- I offer the the love to where I want to pour into you and make sure you're good. Like if you've ever watched the lion in the jungle, take care of their family. That's me in human form. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I know I'm not going to be here forever. I know my daughter is going to have children. I intend to have more children and I know I'm going to have grandchildren. And, you know, just coming up from struggle and, and, um, you know, difficulties and, you know, not having money or resources like that. I, I don't want my child to go through that. You know what I'm saying? And they they often say like, when, when you, when you're poor and that's not a word that you want to use, but when, when you're in that state and you finally get out of it, you never want to go back to it. And that's me. And that's why I want to make sure none of my family has to go through it. You know, I am the, the generational curse breaker in my family. I am going to be the first you know, billionaire, because I'm going to skip over millionaire. We're going to first billionaire <laughs> in in my family, yeah. in, in, in the industry that's ever done this. So um, it gives me a sense of peace knowing that when my time comes, and it's not going to be for another hundred years, but when my time comes, everybody's good. And that that's the whole point of life, of living. Like, we're supposed to have fun, yes. We're supposed to, you know, live our fullest and, and have friends and have family. But Ultimately, we're here to do something. That's why they say you are fulfilled once you complete your purpose here. You're, no, nobody can say they're fulfilled completely because they're not done. You know, you can say I'm fulfilled at the moment with what I'm doing, but I know I have more to go. But I know I'm going. My soul is going to be fulfilled when I know I can lay my I can lay my head down and close my eyes, and my family is forever good. So. That is what legacy is to me. And I want to change the world. Like my family is big too, but just being able to really change the world, Colin, is something like, it's like a different type of high, you know, it's like a, whoa, you really, 
you really have people in China that know you. Yeah. Like you really have people in Russia that know you. People that's women that are saying you you make them want to be better. You're giving them hope. You're giving women that cry to you. Like it's just it's different. You know, it's different and it feels like I'm doing it right. So I want to just be able to make sure I share my passion with the world and allow the world to fall in love with it and just make it a better place because we live in a crazy world right now. And I really do just want to make it a little bit better. So that's if I can answer your question. That's what legacy is to me. Oh, yeah. It's looking forward and it's trying to leave something better than you found it or better than you had and working to that end. And I think it's too often we get stuck in the here and now and not looking down to the road. And that's as simple as sometimes of saving for the future or investing for something better. And then you can go into this. I want to change the world. I want to leave the entire place better because I was here and do something with my time. And that that means a lot of different things for a lot of different people. So as far as the, the grooming industry goes for you, where do you want the, the grooming industry to go? And what do you want it to look like in, in another 15 years or 20? In another 15 or 20 years with the grooming industry, I want to see more acceptance in it. I want to see more respect. Because like I said, I feel like the grooming industry is a very overlooked industry. And I feel like my my little purpose in this, because I don't only stop with grooming, uh, but this was my stepping stone to my complete purpose. But dogs and cats really are um, our life source, right? Some people can never have children, and that's why they have dogs or cats. Some people have lost loved ones, and their dogs help them mourn and get over it. Some people have mental disorders where a dog helps calm them. And in the grooming salon, these animals, they still have to get groomed, right? And they should be handled with love and care the same way that we would handle them at home. And I feel like my purpose is to teach people that. And I want to build an army of groomers that are just bougie, you know, that, that, see luxury you know that i see um life in them that loves what they do that want to be passionate about it you know and that's what i want to do with the industry i love how tv shows now are coming out with dog competitions and i don't really feel like it should just focus on dog competitions but it could focus on the livelihood of groomers as well you know behind the scenes what we go through just so people can have a more understanding and people can be more appreciative of us. You know, people can value us more. Some people literally, they say, one thing people know not to call me is the the groomer. Don't ever call me the groomer (laughs) because that is not my name and that is not my title. Mm -hmm. If you want to call me a title, call me the groomer and get sure in air, but do not call me the dog groomer because me and you might have to have a conversation. (laughs) (laughs) But it's just, I want people to look at us past that. You know, we're like your therapist. We're your dog's therapist. We got to listen to their mouth for hours. We have to deal with them pooping and peeing on us. Like, we have to deal with a lot of stuff. So, you know, just me just sh- showing my light, being who I am, teaching, pouring into other people's cup, that is ultimately, you know, where I see the grooming industry becoming. Like, a lot of me's, but in their own ways, but with the love and the passion and the dedication. That's what I want to see with, you know, the grooming industry. And definitely in less than 15 years, I'll have my own master uh, certification that I'll be able to give to my students. So I'm excited. Yeah, that is really super exciting. And if someone's listening to this and they are feeling inspired and they're saying, oh, you know what? Maybe that is my passion. What are some early steps that you would recommend somebody take if they're interested in getting into grooming or offering that? As a, as a service to their clients? Oh, absolutely. So what I will say is definitely, you know, if it's a calling, I get it. If, you, if, if it's not a calling, try it out first. You know, go to um, animal shelters, uh, go to adoption spots, just try to socialize with dogs for a little bit, get to know them, dogs and cats, pets. Get to know them a little bit to make sure that this is something that you want to get into. Because again, you know, dogs are just, as important as children are. And it's a very, it's a very, it's a job that you need to be extremely responsible for. Mm. So, you know, if it's something that you see you can be responsible for and dedicated to, then I'll say, 
you know, your next step is going to corporate salon, seeing if you can apply as a bather, go to private salon, see if you can intern or shadow somebody, you know, and just, just allow yourself to fall in love with the craft and allow yourself to fall in love with the passion. But most importantly, like just drain yourself, you know, absorb yourself with the knowledge, make sure you want to learn about grooming, learn about dogs, just be dedicated to it. I always tell people, you know, you can't do this if you're not passionate about it because your dogs are going to walk out looking lopsided. (laughs) So I just feel like, you know, make sure you love it so your dog can come out. I just don't feel like a dog should walk out with a head bigger than his body. I just, you know, you got to love it a little bit more. (laughs) So, you know, make sure you're very, very interested in uh, learning your craft, developing your craft. And, um, you know, I'm here. You can always reach out to me. I'm I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I'm happy to tell you a little bit about it. But most importantly, it's just a journey that you're going to be able to appreciate as you go through uh, once you enter into the grooming industry. Yeah. Ashley, I really want to thank you so much for coming on and inspiring us, telling you us about your story and, and how we can better be connected with our purpose and live that out in the actions that we implement in our lives and in our business. But there's a lot more here and you have a lot going on in your life. Uh, So how can people get connected and follow along with everything that you're doing these days? Oh, absolutely. Um, You can definitely follow me on Instagram, Grooming Extraordinaire. I'm on Facebook as well, Diamonds in the Rough, that's R-U-F-F. I'm on TikTok. My handle is Grooming Extraordinaire as well. Um, my email, feel free to reach out to me. That's diamonds in the rough one nine zero at gmail.com. And then you can also catch me on a couple of uh, TV shows, HBO max, hot dog, episode seven, ABC seven, the pet show with Dr. Katie. Um, Oh my God, there's so many. You guys will be seeing me on Hulu soon. Once I'm able to legally talk about it, um, you'll definitely be able to hear about it. But in February 2022, I'm bringing something to the screen that nobody's seen before. So I'm like super psyched about uh, being able to collaborate with the producer that Hulu to bring this show to life. So you guys can find me that way. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Again, a lot to look forward to, a lot to hope in the future. So Um, Definitely need to have you back on to talk about how all of that goes. Uh, Ashley, again, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Oh, Colin, thank you. You were great. Thank you so much for sharing your platform. It was an honor. (laughs) Passion is a currency that you fill. I think this is a really important reminder to us who are in a passion industry. We are so passionate, not just about caring for pets, but about the excellence with which we do that. And passion can run out sometimes, and we have to recharge ourselves. And it's important to remind ourselves that nobody else is going to recharge us. Nothing external is going to be able to do that for us. We are the ones who have to go out and refill ourselves through however that process looks like. And when we discussed luxury and what that meant to her and how she communicates that to her clients, I love when she said, there's no basic cut because this is not a basic salon. That is a very important reminder that as we run our businesses, as we set our prices and we decide what niche we are going to go into... By going into certain niches, we are thereby excluding certain other ones and excluding price points and excluding certain clientele. That's that process of saying no. We've talked about that a lot, about how we say no, both in our marketing, in our messaging, on social media, through our website, and through our operating procedures. But as we know and understand our business more and more, it gets easier to say no to the clients that we don't want and the price points that we don't want either. We want to thank our sponsors today, Time to Pet and Pet Perennials. Make sure you go and check them out if you're interested in a new pet sitting software or sending a sympathy gift to a client who's recently lost a beloved pet. And we want to thank you so much for listening and for sharing the episodes and for showing up here every single week. It means an awful lot to Megan and I, and we are so glad and happy and thrilled that you're getting something out of this podcast. We hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week, and we will be back again soon. 